I'm Helen Williams, and this is The Coach for the Coach, Connecting the Dots. Welcome to A Coach for the Coach. I am your coach, Helen Williams, and thank you guys for joining us again today. Um, this is an opportunity again for you to learn and to grow and to build a community of coaches so that we can help each other. So um, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, feel free to DM me at HMW Sports, same for Instagram, and then make sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel, uh, Helen Williams HMW Sports. We're on every Sunday um, at 6.30. So per usual, I got a shout out, uh, a coach in the school, and today, since my guests and I are sort of connected with, uh, with Wake Forest, I got a shout out, uh, Wake Forest and Coach Jen Hoover, uh, who did a fantastic job this year getting us back to the NCAA tournament. So uh, Coach, Ho Coach Hoover, kudos to you. My guest today is Coach Lisa Stockton, uh, head coach at Tulane. And I might add, I'm, I'm really proud to say she was a former teammate. So welcome, Coach. Well, thank you. I'm glad you gave a shout out to, to Jen. I think she and her staff did a super job. And you know, again, you and I played together for a long time, and we didn't get to that NCAA tournament. So no. yeah, we know that's a hard thing, but I'm really proud of, of what Wake Forest did this year. Yeah, yeah, we were living vicariously through them this year. Definitely. So uh, uh, very excited for them. But I, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I, I wanted to have a conversation with you today because you're one of the few coaches who have actually um, been successful at the same place for an extended period of time. Uh, doesn't really happen anymore. You know, people move around for whatever reasons. Uh, sometimes they're forced to move. Other times they're, you know, uh, want to be uh, seek, seek bigger things or, or whatever. And it's just really kind of just the way the world works today. No one stays in the same place for an extended period of time. But but you've been at Tulane for, you know, 25 years. Uh, you celebrated your 600th win this year. And I just wanted you to share some wisdom with uh, with the coaches and everybody um, you know, kind of like, like how did how did that happen? So I guess the, the first thing I want to ask you is, is is why Tulane? Why 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 are you still there at Tulane? Well, you know, I think like any situation, um, you go and you get a job. I, I, Tulane was a great opportunity for me uh, coming from an assistant coach at Georgia Tech. And here, um, I don't think I came here thinking I'd be here over 25 years. I mean, I came here. It was a great fit for me. It's a lot like Wake Forest. And it's academic, and it was a really good fit. Um, I think what happened is I came here and had success and really loved it. And okay. um, I, I look at this as um, when you find your fit, recognize it. Uh, but the other thing is um, it's probably one of the best things I've ever done is to stay at one place because now this is home and this, these are my players and these are their kids are my kids. And um, I, I think it's been just an amazing experience. So um I'm very fortunate that I made those right decisions. I had opportunities to go elsewhere and I chose to stay here. So um, I, I think it's one of the things that when I finish coaching, I will be the most grateful for. So what, um, you know, when, you, when you're trying to make those decisions and you have those opportunities, what kinds of things did you think about that led you to go, okay, I, I think this is still the best fit for me, even after, you know, so much time has passed? Well, uh, first of all, I, I've had great administration here from the president to the athletic directors. I've had great support. So different opportunities have come up and we've been able to either match things or, or boost the program or, or, or something like that. But I also really tried to not get caught up in, you know, what used to be the BCS or the Power Five or whatever you want to call it at the time about making sure that the job I would be taking would be better than the one I'm leaving. Um, could I be happier personally? Um, could I be happier professionally? Uh, where would I see myself five years from there? Um, you know, I think I really just did a lot of analyzing and didn't get caught in the moment of what was considered big time. Um, a really good friend and administrator told me one time, don't make the best day on your new job the press conference. And I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. As you go in there in the press conference, and you're, there's a lot of hoopla and you're really happy. And then all of a sudden you've got something that maybe um, wasn't what you wanted. And so I'm really, I'm grateful that I had a good advice and I'm grateful that you know, I've had administrators here that wanted us to win at a high level and kept supporting us. What are some of the things that when, when you're considering as far as fit things that you need that not necessarily, I mean, we all know you need a good budget and, you know, that kind of stuff, but what are some of the intangibles that are, that are really important to you that would, would make you want to, you know, stay at Tulane or like, like that, at a place like that for the long time? 
Well, Bursa Tulane for me fit, and to answer your question, the other part I will in a minute, but is the academic, recruiting the academic kid was, I knew a good fit for me, all right? Okay. Uh, but the thing, uh, the things you look for is, I've had a good continuity of staff. My, my coaches have stayed for a long time and that takes budget, that takes money for them. Um, there's times that I've, um, you know, if it comes down to my contract, that I've had things that were deferred payment instead of necessarily salary but also years. Um, you know, the one thing in coaching is sometimes we don't realize that if you have a bad year, you want a contract that, that you know, continues, you can continue to, to, to stay there and, and to build it. So, you know, I've added years to my contract. I've added deferred payment. That those are things for me. Um, but also, you know, what you need to be successful in your conference. Uh, when we were in Conference USA, how could we be in the top three of Conference USA in the things that matter, whether it's travel, whether it's facilities, those kind of things. Um, so I think all those come into play um, to, to what you think you need to be successful. And the other thing is you personally, you've got to figure out what your institution, what you need there, if it's a recruiting budget or if it's recruiting internationally, then you've got to, you've got to approach that. But you've got to figure out what you need to, to, to do at the place you are um, that you feel like you'd be successful. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So you, you were at Georgia Tech. Talk about some of the other places that you were coaching that actually led up to you ending up at Tulane? Well, after I left Wake Forest, I went and got my graduate degree at North Carolina. And that was the first year I worked for Sylvia Hatchell at North Carolina and got my graduate degree in a year. Uh, coming out, um, I had some opportunities to be an assistant coach, but then I had an opportunity at 23, I think about how young that is now, uh, to be a head coach at Greensboro College. And it was a division three school. Um, so Helen, when you and I played at Wake, it wasn't real glamorous, right? We had the van and all that. <laughs> so going to coach yeah. division three was, was okay. I could handle it. Yeah. Um, that was a great opportunity for me um, because I was in that seat at a very young age. And I got, I got a chance to, to really learn about myself a lot, like what I felt like I needed to get better in. And, and um, I knew that um, from that point on, I really loved being a head coach. Um, so I think the thing after, after there, I, I went to Georgia Tech and got to recruit in the ACC and, and had, a, had a taste of that. Um, but the greatest thing about Greensboro College to me was when I came here to Tulane and all of a sudden I was a head coach, um, I'd been there before. It mm -hmm. was a different level, but I felt like I had done it before. I would made the calls at the end of the game. I had prepared a team, although it was a different level. To me, it was, you know, I still had the confidence to go out there and, and lead the group. So I, I thought that for me, that was a great course to get where I am. Yeah, that, that's often that one inch that you move over to the head coaching chair, I think, is the hardest part for people to understand. It's, it's when, when the decisions are yours, um, it's a little bit different than sitting over there and go, well, I'd do this, and I don't know why she did that. I, I, I can't believe he did that or, or whatever, but I think it makes a big difference. What would you what would you tell your 23 year old self um, now that you've had some some time under your belt? Uh, would you do anything differently or, or what would you say to yourself? I think the greatest thing about my 23 year old self is I was naive enough to think I knew a lot. <laughs> you know, I, I took it over and I'd been a player and, you know, in the ACC and I, I'd been at Carolina and I felt like I probably knew more than I did. And that probably gave me confidence. Yeah. Um, I think now looking back, I should panic a little bit more than I did then. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think part of it is um, always be yourself. I, I think you got to be true to yourself. I mean, you know, to me, um, Pat Summit is just a hero to me and it, she was a, a role model for me. And, but I have such a different personality than Pat Summit and I could never, I could never be her. Um, I want to, I would love to look at how she did things and learn from them. But I think the most important thing is to be yourself. And I, I, that's probably the thing I would share with anybody is don't decide how you're going to be until you get there. You've got to be true to yourself because you got to be it every day. And if right. you're not true to yourself, you won't be it every day. No, that's, that's a great point. So there, there have been a lot of things that have changed uh, over the years. I have two questions for you. One, what do you think has been the biggest change? And then two, how have you evolved? What kinds of things have you done to, to make sure that you're still, um, you know, able to be successful? Because we all have to evolve, uh, things change. So we'll, we'll tackle the first one, uh, first question. Well, God, so many things have changed. Um, you know, I mean, resources, I, you know, I think um, 
the amount of money that have gone into every program. I think there used to be programs that were supported a great deal more than others. So I think that the resources have changed a lot. You know, the talent pool has changed a lot. There's so many great players now. There's so much more talent. Um, you know, we still probably don't have the parity I thought we would have. Um, but I, I definitely believe that there's a lot more talent. Um, you know, the pressure on coaches. I mean, you know, again, there's always been pressure on coaches, but I think it's, you know, you don't have long to prove yourself now. And so right. I think coaches, you, you know, you kind of get caught into that. Um, I'm glad I came into it when I did uh, because I think people were more patient. Um, but, it, you know, I, I definitely believe that there has been a lot of change. How have, how have I changed? Um, well, my players, my first year at Tulane would come back and say, I'm so soft now. They think I'm, of course, they remember things of being so much tougher, but um, I, I definitely believe um, the way you coach. I mean, I was never a, a person that yelled and screamed and all that. I, I think that uh, we probably were um, more demanding at times consistently early. I think now um, there's a little more, I say negotiation. I think there's a little bit more of trying to see what the athlete needs trying to see how you can communicate with the athlete individually. I, I definitely believe that you can't communicate with everybody the same. They don't respond right. the same. Right. Um, so you teach differently. Um, you know, your, your expectations at the end of the day are the same of winning at a high level, but how you get there and how you approach um, coaching and how you approach teaching um, definitely has to modify as, as generations change. I do think that, that the kids have changed from, from when you and I were players. And I hate to do the back in the day thing, um, but, but there is a little bit more back and forth now than when we played, you know, it was pretty much whatever the coach said you did. And, and if I called home and had an issue that my parents would be like, well, did you do what the coach said? And that was sort of the, the end of the conversation. Um, and I don't think it's a bad thing that there's a, you know, you know, some back and forth, because I do think that, that they should have an opinion. But how have you been able to, because I know a lot of your players are very complimentary of you, um, you know, even from years back. How, how are you able to have those kinds of relationships where, you know, years later, they're still, you know, Coach, Coach Stockton's okay. <laughs> I still like her. <laughs> well, I think the one thing is, is, you know, we get a chance at this level to recruit the people we want to coach. And when you say fit, like I, I, I recruit, I mean, the players like we play with it at, at Wake Forest. I mean, they're academic, they care about the academics here, but they also want to win at a high level. They're very type A, you yes. know? And, um, but I think the relationship with players is I really like them. Like I genuinely like them, you know? I mean, sometimes it's hard, you know, realize that sometimes it's hard that you've got to make decisions uh, to place somebody over somebody and you really like this kid a lot, you know? And I think I struggle with that. And some of my friends go, well, I mean, that I don't struggle with that, but, but I do because I think I really like them. And I think relationships are about mutual respect. And so in coaching, you know, one of the things that you, you have to make sure you do is you have to pick players that you feel like you can inspire and that you can work with. And, you know, if you take some chances on people that maybe there's not a connection with you or your staff or the players, you know, ultimately that may not work out. And, and you have to know that. So, uh, you know, my staff, I worked with them a long time and they, they know, um, you yeah, know, Chris Stockton would struggle with this kid. And so I think that's part of it. And, you know, you, you, at the end of the day, coaching is about relationships and it is about pushing people. But at the end of the day, they do appreciate if you do, if you genuinely care about them. Yeah. And, and, and how do you decide, okay, this is someone that I, I think I want to coach. I think that's been one of the challenges of COVID um, this time is that I do think, you know, we try to talk to them. We try to get face to face with them. We try to, to get to know them. We try to get to know their families. Yeah. Um, you know, all of those things uh, right now in the last year, we've had blind recruiting um, to where we don't, we, I think there's going to be a real fallout in the next few years of people making choices on zoom calls. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good point. This portal is, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of disasters in this thing. People have never met these people. They've never been to campus. Um, they're making decisions that is going to have to be their last decision. You know, this is their last decision. Um, so to answer your question, I think, you know, building relationships and really doing your research when you're recruiting, I think gives you the best chance of picking people that fit into your program. And 
like we would bring kids on official visits and our players, they give us their input on that official visit. Right. And I think when they do that, they tell us, you know, our kids like everybody most of the time, but I think that they'll tell us if there's warning signs and they'll let us yeah. know at this time in COVID. I mean, our players haven't even met them. So, you know, I'm going to, in, in January one, I'm going to meet two players that walk on campus that I've never met and, and they'll be on our team. Yeah. And that I think is, uh, and you bring me to the next point with the transfer portal, uh, obviously the, the rule was passed now that you can, <laughs> you can, uh, transfer and play right away, at least one time in your uh, career, if I'm, if I'm getting that correct. And I, I, what's your feeling on that? Because I think on the one hand, I understand, like, I think if a coach leaves, then, you know, that player should be able to transfer freely and play right away. But what it also does when you, when you say reference disaster is it doesn't give the opportunity for that kid to work through adversity, right? So I can understand if it's a bad situation, the kid's being mistreated or whatever, but, but not playing as much as you want to working through that adversity and stuff. So, so what are your thoughts on that? There's a lot of thoughts on that. You know, I, I think, uh, I could be like Gino right now and just let it all go. And just tell <laughs> you know, first of all, it's a perfect storm. Um, yeah. You, know, you got COVID. You've got a very, uh, you talked about a, a generation that probably doesn't work through things as much. It's just, you know, and again, I think that's social media. I think it's a combination. The kids are still the same. It's their environments are different. And exactly. so that, you know, that's, that's understandable. But the portal is like online dating and it sounds, they've made it sound so, so, special and so exciting and there's like 920 today I think um and they've made it look like social media is blown up like oh where's this player going to go and they've made it ridiculously attractive and you know I think it's going to be a real disappointment for a lot of people and then even when the players um who picked a school who left who might have been happy at that school might have left and then go somewhere that they've never met anybody never met the team um, I think there's going to be a lot of unhappy people. And again, you don't have, you don't have another opportunity unless you're going to sit or you're going to have a penalty. Um, I, I think all of this is bad, uh, in combination, not, mm -hmm. not each thing, but in combination, it's a bad situation. And then again, the, the, being able to play, you know, I think the transfer portal needs to go away if they're going to get rid of the, the plane. I think it needs to go back to where, you know, again, you have to contact schools individually and things like that, to, to, like we used to, because between the, the transfer portal and between the not having to sit and there's no penalty, uh, you know, they better get rid of the GPA or, or the uh, graduation rates because people are going to do it just because they want to just see what else is out there. Um, yeah. It's not going to be great for our game. I think, and I mean, you obviously don't know this yet because you haven't gone through this year, but, but your approach to, to coaching, is that going to be a little bit different? Um, you know, because there are, there are going to be some coaches I know who's, quite frankly, their jobs are on the line. So, you know, in terms of how they react to certain players and what they do might change where if it was a, a nor quote unquote normal environment, uh, they might not react the same way. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think, the one thing we talk about how things have changed over the years, but the one thing that hasn't changed is them having to go out there and compete at a really high level has never changed. Right. Um, you know, how you adapt your coaching at some point, you have to be able to make hard decisions for the best of the team. And so, I mean, will it change? I, yeah. I don't, I don't really know how it can, uh, you know, because you still have a job to do that. You got to get them ready for competition. And if I don't prepare someone for adversity on the court, and sometimes that's hard decisions, then, then we're not going to win anyway. Um, you know, I, I think the one thing I want to do is educate my players and, and the players coming in, what happens in this transfer portal that don't, don't look at that as the answer completely. And I think we got to, I think we got to educate parents too, that they're going to be, let's say there's 360 people that don't get a scholarship at the same level. I think we need those numbers. I think they need to know that. Um, in two years, how many of the kids that transferred this year, in two years, how many of those are going to be at that same institution? I think those are stats that we really need to come out with because if we don't, I think we're flying blind. Yeah, now, now some staff, uh, some coaches have someone on the staff who is basically in charge of the portal now. 
Um, are, are you like that, or how, how do you how do you handle that? Because, like you said, you said there's 920, so obviously you're you're you're, you're well, looking at it. I haven't seen it. Our, our you know our staff has you know we certainly look at it, and um, you know for us, again, you talk about doing research on kids that you're looking at in high school. You talk about research. We definitely have to research someone who it didn't work out where they are. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just go, oh, she's a good player. Let's take them because right. there might be baggage with that. So you got to make sure that we've called coaches. That if we're going to talk to kids in the portal, we've talked to the coaches they just played for. Um, some people don't want to do that. But I mean, I, you know, I, I've had kids in the portal and these coaches have called me and, I, you know, I'm not going to hurt the kid, but I'm going to be honest about because if I if I tell them something that's not true, then that's setting all up for failure. Um, you know, for us, I mean, I think there can be some real you can get some a good situation out of some people in the portal. Um, I think Tulane is that we're a four year school. Like we are take people, develop them. They're going to get a great degree. I mean, I think that's, you know, I think that's special for us. And I think that's what makes us successful. I think the portal will be used some for us, but not as the answer. And uh, okay. yeah, that's, that, that's my hope. Now, if you talk to me in a year or two from now, maybe that'll be different, but uh, but the other things we have to do with the men do, and I think this is your question about do you coach different is you have to recruit your own players. Yeah. Yeah. Every year you've got to recruit your own players. Um, you know, the one thing I think is those of us that coach women's basketball, have got to make sure we, we make these young women and the families understand is there's no pot of gold at the end of this. You know, if you, if you leave one school and go to another school, um, you know, the end result, how many, how many rookies are going to make a WNBA team this year and, and right. what that salary looks like. And then that's not like the one and done situations. That's not like what's on the men's side. So we, we really have to keep it in perspective that these kids jumping around are probably the worst thing they're doing is, I mean, they're probably developing habits that won't serve them well in life. Um, and there is no pot of gold. Um, so you know, and again, I, I think the, the research on the front end of what school you go to at a high school, really, they really need to look at it and see if they're going to play, if they're going to, what are the, what do they want in that decision and pick the right school because you don't want to go, oh, I can just transfer. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. I, don't, so I don't think that's great for our game at all. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So the portal is one of a lot of things that have changed over the, over the course of your time. How, how do you look at something and go, okay, um, I need to learn that, or this is some somewhere that, you know, that, that I need to improve for, for instance, technology, we were trying to get on this thing and <laughs> neither you nor I. I was kinesiology. What was your major? Cause we didn't do very well with the technology. I, kinesiology as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah, we were uh, full disclosure trying to get this to work and we couldn't tell if it was my end or your end. And, you know, I, personally technology, I will learn as much as I need to learn to do what I need to do. Um, but if I can farm it out, then I'm going to. So, so how do you decide of whatever's new that's coming along that, yeah, I probably need to do this or mm, I can delegate that to my assistants? Well, I think the one thing I try to do is work with my assistants. We work as a team. And, and I mean, there are certain things that, um, is it worth my time? Is it worth, I mean, and some coaches do this. I don't do cut-ups of our players. Like I, I, I'll tell them what I need and what I want. And I'll have a video person do that because I think it's better use of my time doing other things. But I will sit down with a kid and watch that video with them. So I think that's a good use. You know, synergy is probably one of the biggest things that changed everything. I mean, back sure. in the day where we're, you know, I think that kid goes right a lot or, you know, that kind of thing. Those days are over. So really learning how to read synergy. And that really helps me in scouting before I ever get the scout from the staff. Mm -hmm. um, that really helps. Um, you know, how much do you use, you know, how much do you use stats and how much do you use analytics and how much do you use stuff like that? I think those things are things we talk about all the time. You know, we talk about like, um, you know, now you, you shoot threes and layups. I mean, like you teach different threes and layups. Is that, is, you know, is that, where, where does that come in? What percentage of that do you use in your coaching? You use it defensively and offensively. So I think we evolve a lot. Um, and I mean, we were talking about the recruiting before, but I mean, just the actual coaching and stuff is, is so different because, Again, you know, you used to, um, 
I mean, people didn't know everything you did all the time. So now you got to keep it fresher. Like if you want to go to a team and you know they do something on ball screens, you want to do something to keep it fresher. And so you maybe are tweaking things a lot more than you would have mm -hmm. six years ago. You know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'll never feel like I've ever mastered that, like how to, how to use everything. Because sometimes I'll look at my staff and I say, this is just too much stuff. Like we got to narrow it down because at some point it's got to be communicated to the team. So you know, what part of this do we use? Yeah, someone was asking me about analytics the other day when I thought about it. And I said, well, you know, if I were still coaching, I, I personally would use it to just validate my gut feelings. Like we right. know as head coaches kind of if something's off or if something's happening and, and maybe we use the numbers uh, for that, but, but not exclusively, just I'm not going to make a decision based on, on just numbers. They're helpful, but I certainly will let that to be the be in the all end all. Well, I mean, somewhere, you know, I think the thing that I'm very grateful for is I've got over 30 years coaching. So at some point your gut is, is your gut because you've watched a lot and you've done a lot, you right. know, so you do, you do trust that. But I tell you the, the, uh, the breakdowns and synergy of what kids do and don't do are very good teaching tools because they can argue with you all you want. And then you can pull these stats out and you're, you're 10 percentile in that, you know, or something. And, you know, we've done that a lot to change how people play. Like, this isn't working for you, so tell me what's working for you. And I said, you know, as a player, when we were players, I would have loved to have that. Like, right. this this just doesn't work at all for you. And, I mean, you know, it might be th something you think you're good at. And, right. um, you know, so, so I, and I definitely think it helped you send them home in the summer and saying, this is what you have to do. And, um, you know, if you do that, then they can come back and improve their game. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you a couple more questions in terms of, um, you know, we, we keep talking about players. What have you learned from your players that's made you a better coach and a better person? Because we all, I know personally, I improved as a person during my time coaching because I would, you know, have a relationship with a kid and something would happen. And I'd be like, I probably didn't handle that right. I need to, you know, be more, it made me more self-reflective and self-aware. Gosh, I, I learned so much from them. Um, you know, they, they can make me feel really old sometimes, you know, like, especially when it's like a movie or a song that they've never heard of that really makes me feel old. But, um, <laughs> and they think it's a, they think it's a new song and it's like from 50, 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And they will never let me do a playlist. They don't want my playlist, but, um, but you know, I learned something from all day. I mean, I think one thing is, I mean, they're so bright. Like some of the the kids that come in here, I got one in neuroscience and like what she wants to do. She's so much more involved than so many kids her age, like, or that we were our age when, when we were her age. Um, you know, I, I learned a lot. I mean, they're so, um, they have a bigger view of the world. You know, during mm -hmm. this um, social unrest, during all this um, in the spring, we did a lot of work on that. And, um, you know, we really let them run it and them talk about experiences. And I, I learned some things that happened in their families and how they, how it changed their perspective. And I think even things like that, that you think that you're pretty evolved in, that you really kind of know, um, you kind of get the world, they can really show you that you, you, you don't, you know, and that, that they, they teach me those kind of things all the time. Um, you know, I, I think they really, um, you know, they, they really want a relationship with you. And I, I love that. And I think you know, they really can kind of talk about the things that are important to them. And it does really make you learn what this generation, what motivates them. And, mm -hmm. you know, I learn stuff all the time, just, um, you know, trying to find out like what makes them tick. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're really impressive people. I mean, I think there's some things in coaching that we get really, you know, you get frustrated with because they're not patient and everything else. And there's definitely, you know, some things that I wish were different, but they, they're really very impressive people. They really have, there's so much more accepting of everything um, I mean, you know, whether it's interracial, interracial dating. I mean, when we were in school, that would have been such a big deal. Right. You know, they're, they're so, um, they, they've got such a broad mind and they're very accepting of our teammates. I mean, we've had a Muslim kid and a Jewish kid that, that play together and they're fine. Um, and, you know, they, they taught each other different things about the religion. And that's something that I don't know that you would have seen 10 or 15 years ago. Right. Um, but there's so much you can learn from them. And, and I, like I said, I, I do think they're, really evolved and they're very impressive. Yeah. What, what any advice do you have for, you know, a young coach that's starting out that, that will help them, you know, have longevity in this business? Because it is a pressure packed business with a lot of stress and, 
everybody can coach your team better than you can. Um, but but what advice would you give that, that's helped you, you know, stay in the business this long? I think a few things. I think is um, know your role and, you know, whatever it is, if it's video, whatever. And I think and work your butt off and whatever that is. You know, whatever it is, I think really work your butt off and be really good at that. And don't, you know, I, I think so many times people are impatient and they want to be somewhere they're not. Mm -hmm. um, learn that role because someday you're going to be in the other role and are you going to be prepared? So I think that, I think people really appreciate loyalty. Um, you know, I, you know, I know hard work and loyalty go a long way. And I, you know, I got my job at Georgia tech because I'd worked camp and I was a really good camp worker and they thought I'd be really good. Right. So that was a few weeks of camp. People notice when you do yeah. that. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, I think enjoy the ride along it. You know, if you don't, if you have a role where again, you're a GA or, or something like that, enjoy that and be a sponge and soak it in and, and, and enjoy that. Because I think some people don't like where they are and they're always trying to be somewhere else and they miss the moment. So I think that's really, really important. And I think I said it earlier, I said, what, whatever role you are, um, you know, be yourself. And, you know, I, I think that if you're working for someone that you just can't, like, you don't agree with what they're doing philosophically, then you're going to have to move on because you, you got to be loyal to who you work for and you got to move on if you can't agree with it, but also be open-minded that you might learn something from it. And, yeah. you know, I've learned as much from bad coaches that I play for than good coaches. And I learned a lot from bad coaches because I learned everything I didn't want to be. And right. so I, I think that that's part of the process too, that you can do that. But um, you know, I'm so thankful that I, I enjoyed being a young coach and I'm, I'm now, you know, now I still love what I do, but, um, don't try to be somewhere too fast because then you're not going to be ready and you're not going to enjoy the ride and it's not going to be a fun journey. And so that's very philosophical, but I, I think that, um, you know, it's definitely, it's a, it's a tough business. There's a lot of things you, that are really stressful about it. And if you don't enjoy it, it's not worth it. No. Oh. Great, great point, great point to end on. So uh, appreciate your time and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the next 600, right? <laughs> Ooh, I don't know, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it was fun. We'll, we'll, we'll work for uh, 605 is what we're working for now, right? Okay. The, next game, right? the next game. All right, thanks coach. I really appreciate it and good luck this year. Thank you, Helen, bye. If you have enjoyed the information we have provided, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. If you have a question or comment, please let me know by leaving it below. And why stop there? Click on another video and continue learning great tips from a coach for the coach.